All right, so thank you for that introduction, Karen. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And to everyone that's still here, uh, thank you for sticking it out to the bitter end. I realize I'm the only person standing between you and enjoying your weekend, so I'll try and stick on time this. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Cancer drug companies don't like me because I talk about complications of their treatment. So, so the objectives for the next 15 minutes are, I want you at the end of this talk to be able to describe the traditional forms of cardiovascular disease asso associated with cancer treatments. But more importantly, the bulk of the talk is to help you recognize that some of the so-called novel targeted therapies also seem to target the cardiovascular system. So they're associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disorders. And finally, I wanted to leave you with an enhanced awareness of clinically relevant drug interactions with some of the new uh, cancer medications and the cardiovascular medications. So why should you care? So the reality is that no matter what branch of medicine you practice in, you're going to be increasingly dealing with cancer survivors. This figure comes from a recent review article that was published in the New England Journal. And it demonstrates that because of the improvements in early detection of cancer and cancer treatment, we're going to be left with an explosion of cancer survivorship. And if you look at the colors here, you recognize that most of the growth is happening in the orange, green, and purple zones meaning patients between the age of 50 to 85 years old, which is where most cardiovascular disease presents which is, and which is where we tend to do most of our interventions as cardiologists. So increasingly, you're going to be dealing with cancer survivors, and cardiovascular disease is going to be common in these patients. And we've known for a long time that cancer treatments can predispose towards uh, cardiovascular disease. So this is one of the earliest papers describing the anti -tumor clinical anti-tumor efficacy of anthracyclines, which is sort of the backbone of many cancer regimens. And even within this early paper, in 19 children that were treated for cancer, seven patients were about 40% actually developed, if you look at the description, pretty bad symptoms of heart failure uh, early on. So this has been known for a long time, and it's something that oncologists have dealt with you know, with perhaps very little help from cardiologists, um, only sort of when needed and when things became challenging. But this is sort of, this is the drug that was probably responsible for the emergence of the so-called field of cardio-oncology, and sort of led to the, emer to the explosion of interest in cardiovascular disease in cancer survivors. So trastuzumab, or Herceptin, it's a monoclonal antibody that targets the HER2 receptor. Now, this is a receptor that is overexpressed in about one in six women that have breast cancer. And this drug revolutionized the management of these women because it converted that from being a cancer that was dreaded because it had really bad outcomes to being a cancer that was, you never wish cancer on anyone, but it was a cancer that had better outcomes specifically because of this medication. So complete game changer. That being said, the first phase three clinical trial that demonstrated the efficacy of this medication also demonstrated that over a quarter of these patients developed LV dysfunction and or heart failure as a consequence of this medication. So here we were with a brand new shiny medication that had potential, like enormous potential, but where its use may have been limited because of its adverse cardiovascular events. So this sort of began the increasing collaboration between cardiologists and oncologists, and we've come to become very comfortable not just managing this medication, but we've also come to learn that there are, we've come, we're sort of developing experience with trying to manage, mitigate the adverse cardiovascular effects of other cancer treatments. Um, so you probably are, have heard about the risk of heart failure with uh, anthracyclines or trastuzumab. But the reality is the spectrum of cardiotoxicity is becoming much more broad now, and it's becoming a feature of many of the new medications that are coming out. And that's sort of what I wanted to educate you about during this uh, presentation. So a lot of, so, uh, a lot of tumors, well, almost all tumors depend on angiogenesis for their growth because they need a rich blood supply to provide them with food and oxygen. So a lot of solid tumors secrete vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, to promote angiogenesis, new blood vessel formation. So therefore, it makes sense that a, a, you know, a common pathway to try and arrest the growth of tumors would be to starve off the, the tumor of its blood supply by trying to inhibit angiogenesis through the VEGF pathway. And because of this, uh, drug companies have generated multiple medications that target the VEGF pathway at multiple steps along its pathway, including bevacizumab, which at one point was the highest grossing medication in the world. So these medications have been shown in different settings to be efficacious in um, improving outcomes, mostly in patients that have metastatic cancer. So patients that really don't have other options in terms of uh, you know, keeping them alive or controlling their uh, growth of their cancer. That being said, the VEGF pathway is also 
integral to the maintenance of the homeostasis of the endothelium and the cardiovascular system. And because of this, we weren't surprised to see that inhibition of the VEGF pathways associated with multiple adverse cardiovascular effects. So a table on the bottom comes from a systematic review and meta-analysis that we did that sort of demonstrates that the most frequent adverse effect associated with VEGF inhibitors is hypertension. So one in six patients will develop hypertension that they wouldn't have developed without this medication, and about one in 17 will develop severe hypertension, which is defined as a blood pressure greater than 160 over 100, blood pressure requiring more than three medications to treat, or blood pressure requiring emergent care, so going to the emergency department, hospitalizations, theoretically death, although that hasn't been reported in the literature. That being said, there's a smaller but still a significant and real risk of other more serious adverse cardiovascular events. Cardiac dysfunction, heart, heart failure, arterial thromboembolic events, and also heart attacks. That being said, these rarely cause death because the prognosis of these patients, I want to emphasize this, is driven by their malignancy. Um, so because of this, you, you know, you, if you really want to do your patients a service, you'd want to try and do whatever you can to try and manage the adverse cardiovascular effect to try and allow the patient to continue these medications. So another class of medications that has generated a ton of interest recently have been immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it's, it's a brilliant idea. So, what, so the purpose of these medications are actually to activate the immune system so the immune system turns around and attacks the cancer rather than have chemotherapy do it. And it's been efficacious in multiple uh, disease settings, most commonly metastatic renal cell carcinoma and metastatic melanoma. And the poster child, or I guess the poster man for the success of this medication is uh, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. He was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma several years ago. And an older man with metastatic melanoma, you know, five, ten years ago would have been expected to pass away very quickly. Um, he's still alive, and he's functionally cured of his metastatic melanoma. And his cure is attributed to one of the immune checkpoint inhibitor medications called Prembluzumab. So, they're not, so m many of these medications are sort of coming down the pipeline, and they're going to be used in essentially every malignancy uh, you can think of. The, but there's no such thing as a free brunch. If you're going to wake up the immune system to attack the malignancy, it's probably going to attack other parts of the body. And there's been an immune-mediated um, adverse effect with checkpoint inhibitors that has been um, described for essentially every part of the body, but with different frequencies and different adverse effects. So unfortunately, the heart is also affected. So if you look at the highlighted bar here, you can see that relative to other organs, rates of myocarditis are believed to be rare. But if you look at the dark green bars and you look at the fatality rate, you can see it's a very ominous development when it happens, with fatality rates of over 40%. Um, in the first series of cases that were recognized. And these patients, when they die, they tend to die very quickly, within like two weeks of the first signs and symptoms of presentation. So part of the challenge here is that we didn't really know about this, and we haven't been recognizing it. So the first table comes from a pharmaco an international pharmacovigilance database. Um, and you can see that the rates of recognition and reporting of myocarditis has been increasing exponentially as we've come to know that this complication exists. Part of the challenge is that the, the, present, the typical presentation of myocarditis here isn't sort of what we're used to when we think about myocarditis. We think of, you know, perhaps pericarditic chest pain, severe LV dysfunction, heart failure. And although patients can present this way, they can also sometimes present just with ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death as a first presentation. They can also present with atrioventricular conduction blocks, so basically requiring a pacemaker. Uh, they can present with pericardial effusions and pericarditis. They can present with myocardial infarcts, or they can also present with LV dysfunction, but without inflammation in a pattern that has been attributed to a Takotsubo-like syndrome. So some of the best data that we have in terms of characterizing the clinical presentation comes from a case control study from eight centers that treat these patients, including uh, the UHN. So my mentor, Dinesh Tavindiranathan, was one of the co-authors here. And so we've learned some important things about what this looks like. So first is if you look at the bar on the left of the screen, this sort of illustrates the time points at which patients present. So almost all these patients present within the first four months. Uh, the vet and all but one patient within this case series presented within six months of beginning of the checkpoint inhibitor, although one patient presented five years later. So, it, so just because patients make it past the six-year mark doesn't mean that they're clear. Now, the pie charts to the right here demonstrate that, unfortunately, there is no pathognomonic presentation. So almost everyone has ECG abnormalities, but not everyone. 
And even the ECG abnormalities can sometimes not be very clear. So a lot of times they can just be nonspecific repolarization abnormalities that we ignore, multi we see many times at the end we ignore. Almost everyone has a troponin elevation, but not everyone does. But then the flip side is many patients have troponin elevations, but don't happen to have myocarditis. An important thing to remember is that when we think about myocarditis, we think about weak hearts. We think about severe LV dysfunction. Almost half the patients in this case series actually had ejection fractions that were over 50%. It's not the same presentation that we're used to. And even some of the newer biomarkers, such as anti-pro-BMP, are not particularly helpful. Not illustrated here is cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI is also helpful where you look for patterns of edema or late gadolinium enhancement, but even that is not 100% uh, sensitive in this setting. So it's a very difficult thing to diagnose, but has important consequences. So I think the bottom line here is if this becomes a concern, you really need to pick up the phone and speak to the patient's oncologist uh, to try and decide um, what the next step should be in terms of managing these patients. Okay, so switching gears to multiple myelomas. So multiple myeloma is another, another um, malignancy where outcomes have improved substantially. I remember being in medical school and being lectured about this and being told that essentially it, multiple myeloma uh, almost always leads to an, an unavoidable painful death. Now, the outcomes have improved substantially because of improvements in stem cell transplant, but also improvements in some of the medica medical therapy available, including proteasome inhibitors. So the proteasomes are the organelles within the cell that break down proteins. So if you turn off, if you inhibit proteasomes, you can't break down proteins and they build up in cells. And in multiple myeloma cells, which make massive amounts of immunoglobulin proteins, if you turn off proteasome inhibitors, essentially the waste builds up and the cells uh, uh, essentially die in their own waste. So I've been an initial generation of proteasome inhibitors, Velcade or bortezomib, and then carfilzomib is a third generation proteasome inhibitor, and it's an irreversible proteasome inhibitor. And this paper, this New England Journal paper demonstrates, as a phase three trial that demonstrates that carfilzomib has been associated with improved myeloma-specific outcomes in patients that have relapsed or progressed after first-line therapy. So once again, a patient group that doesn't have any other options. And the improvement in this to this improvement in this setting is quite important, so this is quoted directly from the discussion section of the paper. But no other regimens have been associated with an equivalent duration of medium progression three for survival in the absence of stem cell transplantation in these patients. The problem is, once again, we see a signal for adverse increased cardiovascular risk. There's a doubling of the risk of hypertension and about a 50% increase in the risk of heart failure and ischemic heart disease. Now, you have to remember, patients that get into clinical trials are very carefully handpicked, right? They need to have a high risk of cancer, but very low risk of other um, comorbidities. So in our, in our clinical experience, we've been seeing much higher rates of um, hypertension, LV dysfunction, and heart failure. Um, in this patient group uh, that we've been managing. Okay, finally, the last medication I wanted to talk, talk about is Ibrutinib, or the Brut, as one of my patients likes to call it. So it's a medication that's used for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's a Brutinib's tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was initially used as a second-line treatment, but it's probably going to move into being used in first line for the treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And once again, another New England Journal paper that demonstrates that patients treated with Ibrutinib compared to standard of care are associated with an 84% reduction in progression, but also 84% reduction in overall death. So very impressive uh, efficacy of the medication. Unfortunately, abrutinib is associated with a quadrupling of the risk of atrial fibrillation. So in this meta-analysis from clinical trial data, uh, the risk of atrial fibrillation over about two years goes from about 0.8% to 3.3%, or a number needed to harm of 40. Now, the challenge is, so CLL is a disease of older people, and older people that have atrial fibrillation need to be anticoagulated to reduce the risk of stroke. The problem is chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a disease where patients have thrombocytopenia, so they have low platelet counts, but their platelets are also dysfunctional. So they already have a high bleeding risk. And then ibrutinib inhibits platelet function further, so it increases bleeding risk further. So if you look at meta-analyses of bleeding risk in these patients, you're looking at event rates of about 20% per year. And if you look at rates of serious bleeding, you're looking at about three major bleeding, you're looking at about 3% per year. And if you look at the impact of ibrutinib, so ibrutinib compared to patients who have CLL and are not treated is associated with a tripling of the bleeding risk in those uh, patients. So it really puts us in terms of a conundrum about what to do about anticoagulating patients that have atrial fibrillation in this setting. There's no clear answer. There's a lot of variation between what different practitioners do. 
I personally tend to think about what that patient's specific bleeding risk, but I tend to avoid anticoagulating them unless their CHADS VAS score is more than three, but that's just my practice. Okay, and then finally, I wanted to use ibrutinib as a case to illustrate a principle that may apply to a lot of cancer drugs, but ibrutinib has a lot of drug interactions. Uh, so ibrutinib is a substrate of the CYP3A4 pathway. Um, so anything that inhibits the CYP3A4 pathway is going to lead to higher levels of ibrutinib. Now, a lot of the medications that we use for atrial fibrillation inhibit CYP3A4. So verdrapamil and amiodarone are very potent CYP3A4 inhibitors, and diltiazem also inhibits the CYP3A4 pathway, but to a lesser extent. So they're going to increase levels of fibrutinib. On the other hand, ibrutinib inhibits the p glycoprotein pathway, and the p glycoprotein pathway is important for the clearance of a lot of medications that we use in the setting of atrial fibrillation, in partic particularly dabigatran. So you should not be using dabigatran in combination with ibrutinib. All the factor 10A inhibitors, the DOAC, such as apixaban, rivaroxaban, and adoxaban, digoxin, verapamil, and deltazem. So you can imagine a situation in which someone gets uh, started on ibrutinib, develops new onset AFib, gets treated with deltazem for rate control, and rivaroxaban for anticoagulation. I don't mean to pick on rivaroxaban, it's just what I happen to use the most because it's a once-a-day medication. Uh, but this applies to all 10A inhibitors. So you can have a patient who gets started on ibrutinib, whose P-glycoprotein pathway gets inhibited, whose deltaism levels go up, CYP3A4 levels go down, ibrutinib level clearance goes down, ibrutinib levels go up, further inhibition of the P-glycoprotein pathway, and, active, and this cycle sort of goes on and on, which would leave you then with much higher levels of the DOAC uh, that the patient was started on and put them at a higher risk of bleeding. So it's really important to think about these uh, interactions. It's one of the things that I think about in deciding whether to anticoagulate someone or not. But in general, if you are going to rate control patients with ibrutinib, you should try and avoid the calcium channel blockers uh, because warfarin also comes with its own issues in regards to bleeding risk and uh, labile INRs. So I know that was quite a bit. The conclusions that I wanted to leave you with are that traditional forms of cardiotoxicity from anthracycline or trastuzumab continue to be an important issue that you're going to see. But increasingly, you're going to need to be vigilant with cardiovascular adverse effects of the so-called targeted therapies, which also target the cardiovascular system. So FEGF inhibitors are associated very commonly with uh, increased uh, hypertension, but also a smaller but significant increase in the risk of atherosclerotic and embolic events, LV dysfunction, and heart failure. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are associated with a small but serious risk of myocarditis that is very difficult to diagnose, but you're going to need to have a high index of suspicion for. Proisome inhibitors for multiple myeloma are associated with a higher risk of hypertension, heart failure, and possibly cardiac ischemia. Ibrutinib is associated with a fourfold increase in the risk of atrial fibrillation. So in terms of general principles, in terms of managing these patients, you have to be aware of controlling their risk factors, thinking about their bleeding risk if you're going to use an antithrombotic, and be aware of drug interactions. And another general point is this is going to be a setting in which we probably cannot manage these patients in the, using the guidelines that are attributable to all patients with cardiovascular disease. Instead, we're going to have to sort of go back to basics and think about the personalized art of medicine, where you think about what the risk is for that patient, what the anticipated benefit is, and what their prognosis is from both a cardiovascular perspective and also a cancer perspective. Okay, I thank you for your attention, and I think we'll be taking questions now.